Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Kozlowski, and I'm from the Winslow Technology Group. And this morning, we're going to talk about risk management uh, in terms of cybersecurity. So from risk to resilience, strengthening cybersecurity by embracing the breach. But first, a little bit about the Winslow Technology Group. Uh, we like to make IT personal. Uh, we leverage our passion and, and expertise. We have like four on-staff CISSPs to really deliver uh, excellent outcomes, whether that's uh, you know, on the desktop side, the data center side, networking and cloud, cybersecurity, of course, is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're uh, we're here to help you uh, with your uh, technology challenges. We are headquartered in Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, we have an office in New York City, Charlotte, North Carolina, and down in Washington, D.C. as well. Without further ado, uh, we'll get right into it. So risk management, and we're going to talk about uh, risk management and cybersecurity and, and how, uh, you know, taking this uh, perhaps... Uh, otherwise boring approach can uh, can actually <laughs> uh, reward you with some uh, some pretty great outcomes. So first, uh, I like to talk about embracing the breach. Um, so despite our best efforts, uh, we are able to certainly minimize and prepare for incidents, but uh, cyber attacks and breaches are unfortunately inevitable. Um, in the course of your career or your organization's uh, business or you know, course of business, uh, you will encounter a cyber attack, right? Um, so you will, uh, not might. It's the old, uh, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and, and that's certainly true. Now, using the defense in depth, so your layered approach to cybersecurity is, is certainly like your best uh, way to organize a defense, right? Um, but how do you inform like the defense in depth strategy you're going to be using? How do I understand like what, uh, where do I want to spend uh, my money when it comes to uh, organizing a defense in depth solution? Because because certainly it, um, it could add up pretty quickly um, and, and might not deliver uh, the value that uh, that your organization is is seeking to get based on the unique uh, or perhaps not so unique, like in the case of ransomware, uh, risks that you face. Um, so using uh, this notion of uh, risk management, informing defense in depth, and really just embracing the breach like it's going to happen, um, with, with this approach, uh, you can minimize your losses when a breach happens. You increase your chances of rapid recovery, so less downtime, right? Um, and intelligently allocate your budget to maximize value. Uh, so most customers do not have an infinite cybersecurity budget, and they need to determine how do I prioritize time, effort, um, you know, money uh, when it comes to investing in cybersecurity solutions and, and understanding your risks, quantifying that, and uh, uh, determining uh, how to you know best allocate your budget. Really, uh, really is uh, is that. So uh, similar to the old phrase, embrace the suck. Uh, we really need to uh, embrace the breach. So why risk management? I mean, this could uh, this could otherwise be a fairly droll, uh, boring, uh, perhaps insurance sales pitch. No offense to our insurance uh, folks out there, right? But uh, but you know, risk management actually um, has some pretty good values uh, to it. It's some some good benefits to you as an organization, right? So um, you can uh, prioritize your spend in different initiatives based on data. Uh, maybe you want to uh, explore a future business where uh, you may be taking on uh, contracts and have some requirements around CMMC or ITAR or EAR or HIPAA or PCI, whatever, right? Um, starting with a risk management program can help your organization take on that business rapidly um, in the future without uh, without having to per perhaps perform like a full-on gap uh, assessment or analysis, right? Um, this one's pretty big. Like this, uh, this will actually help, uh, especially our technologists, convert uh, tech talk into business talk and overcome the cybersecurity is super expensive uh, discussion in context, right? Um, like everything could appear expensive. I mean, if I uh, if I don't use a pencil and I buy a case of pencils, um, that certainly would uh, would seem to be expensive, right? Um, but if it's uh, if it's a pencil I use uh, for the course of my you know daily life every day, and I just really love these pencils, uh, certainly uh, it was uh, it was worth it and and not uh, comparatively um, you know expensive, I suppose. Risk management can help address regulatory and compliance concerns. Um, so this is uh, an you know an increasing and important part of um, our customers' business, whether it's privacy, um, you know, general regulatory, or um, other other compliance situations. Uh, you know, taking a risk managed approach uh, certainly and very directly uh, helps with that. And last but certainly not least, I uh, I see a lot of folks still struggling uh, once they've adopted a framework with uh, with using spreadsheets and things of that nature, right? It's uh, it's pretty difficult to pivot from one framework to another um, if you're using uh, spreadsheets, and it's actually pretty difficult to generate some nice like executive reports to uh, to report on, especially our sys admins and technologists to report on your uh, your success. Um. I'd like to take a step back and, and talk a little bit about ships and uh, the Titanic and uh, risk management over time, right? 
Um, so we all uh, sort of know that on uh, tragically on April 15th in, in 1912, uh, the Titanic sunk and it took about 1,500 uh, passengers and crew with her. Um, and, and this this had some really important uh, ramifications across the uh, maritime uh, space, right? Um, so there's a really interesting paper uh, online and an essay uh, available um, by an individual named Roy Brander. Um, it's it's just like an interesting, uh, you know, essay, if you will, on uh, money management versus risk management, right? And I want you to keep in mind um, some of perhaps the parallels to cybersecurity uh, in this uh, in this like brief story here. So interestingly enough, uh, before the Titanic, about 50 years before, uh, there was this incredible ship uh, called the Great Eastern. Um, the Great Eastern was uh, perhaps not quite as big as the Titanic, but uh, certainly at its time, it was one of the largest, but not just largest, one of the most um, engineered uh, vessels, right? So uh, so I liken this to um, when I see someone that has like a really solid defense and depth strategy and they have a whole bunch of layers of cybersecurity, right? Uh, the Great Eastern was like that. It had a, it had a double hull. It had uh, watertight bulkheads, a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So, so interestingly, uh, off the coast of Long Island, uh, I actually live in Connecticut, so I'm familiar with uh, with this area, right? Um, the Great Eastern uh, scraped up against a whole bunch of uncharted rocks, uh, similar to uh, what happened with the Titanic and the uh, the old iceberg there. Um, and interestingly, uh, the outer hull was uh, was certainly gashed, and the ship was very badly damaged, but uh, the inner hull was uh, was unbroken, and the engine room. Uh, remain nice and dry. So uh, not only did uh, the Great Eastern remain uh, afloat, uh, but she under her own power uh, made it into New York the next day and, and not a soul was hurt. So this is this is 50 years uh, before the Titanic, right? So this is like um, in cybersecurity, what good looks like when you have a really nice defense and depth strategy going on. Uh, enter the Titanic, uh, beautiful, beautiful ship, um, right? Uh, but, but the problem with the Titanic was uh, we started to sacrifice uh, you know, uh, things, right. Um, engineering, uh, you know, kind of like took a back seat and, and the risk of a total loss or other losses were, uh, under calculated perhaps in the, you know, in favor of short-term profit and the overall passenger experience. Um, you know, it's, it's really not true, uh, that people thought this ship couldn't sink. The engineers knew, uh, there were certain risks, but, uh, but those risks were not properly managed, especially in the context of, uh, of human life. Right. Um, so the deck wasn't really watertight. Uh, the bulkheads weren't uh, totally watertight or tall enough, as, as we know now. And, and perhaps most importantly, there was uh, there was no double hull, right? So when the Titanic scraped against that iceberg, uh, there was no uh, no extra protection there. So the Great Eastern had defense in depth, right? So kind of back to our cybersecurity program, um, the Great Eastern had no sacrifice of uh, of you know like the double hull and and things of that nature, right? Um, she uh, she really was uh, a, a safe ship. Um, so after the Titanic incident, uh, many other ocean liners at the time were uh, expensively retrofitted. So um, I liken this to um, when we help folks with a cybersecurity incident and, uh, you know, unfortunately, incident happens. Uh, perhaps they didn't do enough preparation or uh, evaluation of cybersecurity uh, products and tools and, and, you know, writing incident response plans to, to prepare um, for that inevitable inevitable incident or breach, um, it's uh, it's similar to this. Like you, you end up spending a whole ton more after the fact, and it causes a lot more uh, chaos and, and damage um, after the fact. So so retrofit bad uh, designing with security uh, up front uh, is good, right? So what can we learn uh, about risk management from the Titanic? And I'm going to pivot a little bit uh, to uh, to your role. So I want to say congratulations to all our sys admins out there. Uh, you are now a risk manager. <laughs> uh, what uh, what hat are you wearing today now, right? Uh, you have your cybersecurity hat, your sysadmin hat, your uh, uh, manager hat. Uh, well, now you have a risk manager hat. And um, unfortunately, uh, today's uh, IT director, you know, sysadmin is, uh, is certainly part, if not mostly uh, techie, uh, to part fortune teller, uh, if that makes sense in terms of, um, you know, anticipating uh, risk and anticipating incidents. I mean, just remember like the good old days when uh, servers were really just our uh, our biggest concern. So what, which hat are you wearing today, right? <laughs> so what is risk management, right? Uh, risk uh, management uh, involves, uh, you know, uncertainty, uh, you know, about uh, an outcome, right? Uh, so that usually combines uh, the likelihood of an event or an incident and its consequences, uh, usually involving some sort of loss. So that would represent risk, right? And then management 
uh, would be taking a proactive approach to identifying, assessing, and controlling risk through mitigation, you know, monitoring, reporting, and really adapting to current conditions, right? So we're we're talking about identifying uh, areas uh, that could cause harm to your organization, right? And uh, mitigating those and, and using uh, an intelligent methodology to uh, to do that, right? Um, so the key components of risk, uh, especially in the context of cybersecurity, would be a threat. Uh, so that's a potential cause of harm, uh, a vulnerability, so a weakness that could be exploited. And then the impact, and this impact is the uh, potential consequence or damage uh, of, uh, of, you know, said, uh, said you know, threat uh, by vulnerability. Now, um, I'll, I'll kind of like pause here uh, and talk about asset and data classification. So without um, understanding the sensitivity of your assets, without um, understanding uh, the value of the data that you have, and without um, really uh, locating and identifying and, and tagging critical data and assets, um, the rest of this isn't overly useful, right? Um, you, you need to know uh, what data needs to be managed, what systems need to be managed, um, how to prioritize and how to really streamline overall risk management. And this uh, plays uh, heavily into some of the next slides, right? So I, if you have not uh, done a data classification or asset classification activity, um, I would strongly encourage uh, this as uh, one of the next steps. And we'll, we'll kind of get to, uh, to next steps towards the end, uh, but I could not um, emphasize this one uh, enough perhaps. So how do we determine asset value, right? Um, so when we talked about risk, uh, we were talking about something had a uh, value um, on that previous slide, we talked about data classification and how that pertains to risk management. Um, there's a couple couple uh, factors that influence uh, asset value, right? And this could be data, this could be process, this could be a system. Um, so, so some of the factors would be uh, business impact. So this would be direct loss potential uh, for your organization, uh, loss of opportunity. It could be reputation, right? Uh, brand and trust are everything in uh, in many, many industries. And, uh, you know, having a cyber attack and having to report on that could be a very damaging to an organization. It could be regulatory. Uh, this could be fines, legal consequences, the loss of contracts, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so, so the value of a particular asset has several factors. Um, some of these uh, factors or some of these assets, I should say, uh, have clear financial values. Like you can say, um, you know, this uh, pencil has a value of like uh, half a cent. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but other things don't like uh, reputation or trust. Um, that that you know is worth something to your organization, but perhaps has more of an intangible value. Um, life cycle matters, and this this talks to um, not only understanding like risk management at a point in time, um, but risk management as an ongoing practice. Right, we uh, cycle out systems, we cycle out uh, you know solutions and cloud providers and, and things of that nature. So it's really important to understand that um, this exercise of risk management really needs to be repeated uh, over its lifetime. Um, there's dependencies. So um, perhaps one asset on its own uh, is not worth much, uh, but maybe that asset affects the value or functionality of other assets, right? Um, so, uh, you know, in, in this example, I talk about a database, right? So let's say the front end application, like your web store, uh, kind of like is the thing that you're delivering, right? But it's powered by some database behind the scene. Um, if that database was lost, uh, you know, it would certainly impact uh, the, the front end of your store there, right? And then uh, last but not least, when it comes to asset value, it's, it's important to understand your total replacement cost. So this is beyond just the immediate value. How much would it cost in time, resources, money um, to really replace or cover that particular asset? So this is this is like the all things considered, if you will, uh, approach to, uh, to asset value. So when, when we're doing some risk calculations and we're building up to that, um, we, we need to uh, talk about loss expectancy, right? Um, so this starts with single loss expectancy. So what, what your loss expectancy is, is you're saying like, look, um, if uh, this thing uh, goes offline, this is uh, a potential monetary loss uh, from a particular event, right? Um, so when we were talking about risk earlier, we were talking about um, an adverse uh, action or adverse situation uh, with the potential for loss, in this case, money. Um, and, and what we're talking about here is, is a very specific um, acronym, so SLE, uh, which is your single loss expectancy that basically says like, if this incident happens and we're, you know, we're going to say like a ransomware attack, if, uh, uh, you know, if uh, we have like a hurricane, whatever, um, if this had corruption in a database, right, um, if this happens, this could be uh, the loss of that, um, you know, event, right? Um, so so that's uh, one incident. It doesn't matter how often it happens. It just means uh, one incident. 
we take the exposure factor, and, and this is a, a bit of a multiplier here, and this is the percentage of a loss that an asset would experience from a particular threat. So this represents the kind of magnitude, if you will, of a loss resulting from uh, an event or um, you know the value that that asset is reduced. So uh, for example, uh, back to, uh, I don't know, like my, uh, my you know, pencil example here, I guess, right? Um, let's say I have like this box of pencils and um, if I, you know, lose one of them, it's not really a big deal. Uh, so that might be like, you know, it's one out of a hundred, one percent. But if I lose like, you know, like 90 percent of the pencils and then I break the other one in half, like uh, I'm fairly, uh, fairly exposed there. And also that was not really the best example uh, for this, but uh, but we'll roll with it. <laughs> um Last but not least here is the monetary loss. So this uh, this actually is representative of the uh, financial loss from a single adverse event. Event. So what this does is this um, connects the uh, the event. Uh, so perhaps like a ransomware attack with the impact uh, that it would have uh, on your business in terms of magnitude, if you will. So that would be your exposure factor, and this is going to give you uh, a monetary loss. So this is uh, this is what you have to uh, to work from. Uh, so this is me uh, in the backyard. I, I have one of these little pizza ovens, right? Uh, and like, I, you know, I was using it the other night and all I could think about was like risk management here, right? Like uh, dinner is at risk. <laughs> um, so uh, so in this uh, this example, um, let's say the asset is a uh, family pizza dinner, right? So it's uh, it's pizza dinner night and we got our, our uh, you know, oven going there. And, and I don't know how many of, uh, I don't know how many of you folks like have one of these ovens or have used one, but uh, if you don't time this thing right or, you know, look the other way for 10 seconds too long, you will end up with a piece of carbon that's uh, more charred than you could ever, ever possibly imagine. You're like, how could pizza get so charred, right? Uh, that's uh, that's how this works. So let's say uh, let's say that the uh, asset value for this uh, overall dinner experience uh, is about 250 bucks, right? So this is the cost of kind of like the pizza materials, the toppings, fuel for the little pizza oven, some beer, and you know, so on and so forth, right? This is this is about what this uh, asset will uh, will cost us, or the value of delivering uh, some sort of like uh, dinner to your family, uh, maybe more than that. I don't know, but we'll uh, we'll go with 250 bucks here. Um, so in this case, uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, over time and in using some statistics, I, I said to myself, well, how many, how many pizzas do I usually burn here? And I'd say it's one out of four. Um, so, uh, my exposure factor in this, uh, fairly simplistic example, when the, uh, pizza is badly charred, the, uh, total edible pizza that I'm able to make is about 75%, right? Um, so in this case, my exposure factor is, uh, is 25%. So I'm going to calculate my SLE, right? And this was my uh, my uh, right single loss here, uh, 250 bucks times 0.25, and that equals 6250. So what does this mean uh, from risk management in this little pizza oven example? I have a uh, you know less than or equal to a 62 dollars and 50 cents uh, for extra dough, pellets, and toppings to not completely ruin dinner. So this uh, this tells me, hey, look, like. Um, you know, if you're going to, you know, you know, invest in, in this dinner situation here, spend a little extra, have a little extra dough, have a little extra toppings and, uh, and don't completely ruin dinner. Right. So that's, that's an example of a single loss expectancy. So the SLE, right. This is pretty, pretty simple to walk through actually. And, um, I would say like, don't overcomplicate this, you know, make some, uh, reasonable assessments as to the value of your asset, your exposure factor, and so on and so forth. When it comes to calculating risk in the context of cybersecurity and, and other events that perhaps uh, less frequently than once a year, like I, I hope you don't have a cybersecurity incident, uh, you know, once a year, um, we, we need to annualize that. So what we do is we uh, take this concept of an SLE and we uh, multiply that by the annual rate of occurrence. So perhaps it's something that happens like once every five years or something along those lines. And now we come up with the annualized loss expectancy. And this is what's going to build to the number that allows you to budget for uh, cybersecurity services and solutions. So why don't we uh, why don't we ditch the pizza oven example and we'll talk through a cybersecurity uh, risk example. Um, so in this case, this is the uh, the ransomware attack, right? Um, so targeted ransomware attack takes that company database offline for a week. Um, this was that database, if you will, that powers the uh, the online store. Uh, so this is the uh, the asset. Um, let's say the asset value is about a million bucks. Um, this powers our our online store, and uh, for argument's sake, and just the example uh, here, uh, we're gonna say it's a million bucks. Um, when the online store is down, uh, we lose about 80% of our revenue, right? Uh, so about 20% or less of orders come in through like the phone or some more traditional means. 
Um, and, uh, and we'll say that we are 80% exposed when this particular database is down because it directly impacts the, uh, the online store. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky, right? Like you're like, how do I figure out how often something like this is going to happen? Um, I, I actually like using some of the uh, online statistical sources that, that really cost you nothing. So uh, there's like Verizon reports, AT&T reports, and, and so on and so forth. So you can, you can figure out like based on your industry or uh, you know, just every industry, whatever size of business, how often something like this is happening. Um, so in this case, uh, there was a successful ransomware attack, uh, according to one of these uh, sources, well, you know, once every five years. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is 0.2, right. Uh, becomes our annualized rate of, exp of occurrence. I'm sorry. And then we do some, uh, calculations here. So our single loss expectancy would be a million dollars times 0.8 or $800,000. But if I look at it purely from an annual perspective, I'm going to take the 800,000, multiply it by 0.2, and now I have 160,000. So um, this database is super important. Um, you know, it, it might make sense at up to $160,000 a year to protect it um, from this, uh, this type of loss. It's really important to translate uh, technical risks into business impact. And this is where I'm going to talk to our sys admins and, and things of that nature, right? Um executives and, and folks on the board, they're not technologists. Uh, they don't, they don't know anything about, uh, next generation firewalls and deep packet inspection and stuff like that. And that's okay. Right. That's okay. What, what they know about though, is, uh, they know about money, uh, finance business terms. So, um, so this is my kind of call to action for our sys admins and more technical folks is if you go through a couple of these exercises by translating uh, technical risk, if you will, into uh, business impact and, and really running through even like a couple of these scenarios, um, I, I think you'll find that things like budget justification, like cost benefit analysis and really prioritizing uh, what's going on or just simply accepting a risk, uh, you know, may be well founded. Right. Um, so so this is the whole notion of using risk management to uh, inform uh, your you know priorities and, and your overall cybersecurity spend. So I'm going to pivot back to another example here, and this is again on our our database attack and and how we're going to uh, you know make a budget, if you will, to protect this, right? Um, so again, the company database, um, this value is two hundred fifty thousand a day or a million dollars for a four day outage. Um, we are going to lose uh, eighty percent of revenue if that store is down. Um, again, same thing. ARO is 0.2, so one in five years, this type of attack happens. Our SLE is eight hundred thousand, and our ALE is one hundred sixty thousand. So. Um, all this is uh, solid here. Um, let's say a particular uh, solution uh, could reduce our exposure factor to 20%, right? Um, so let's say, uh, you know, it, it reduces the outage from four days to one day, something along those lines. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll say, you know, whatever, whatever solution or control we're going to put in place reduces this um, exposure factor, right? Um, down to 20%. And with this type of solution, our annual rate of occurrence to 10 years, right? So, um, the new SLE, just based on uh, you know a, a million bucks times 0.2 is 200,000, and our new ALE, so our annualized rate of uh, occurrence, uh, our annualized loss expectancy, I'm sorry, is now 20,000 with this new solution in place. So the delta between uh, you know these these two figures here, with doing nothing, uh, if you will, and then doing something, the solution that can reduce it, um, really gives us with a budget uh, of uh, you know about 140 grand uh, to protect this database. So this is this is um, kind of like a uh, a way to walk through and identify risks and really tie them uh, to money and, and help you uh, with these models. So like also um, I, I'd like to say when we talk about models, they're just models. It doesn't say this is 100% perfect. It basically says uh, this is one way uh, you can spend your money to reduce the risk. Now, there's always uh, this notion of balancing security and convenience, um, risk reduction and user friction. Um, I, I like to say this because there's always the risk of uh, convenience and this whole convenience factor there, whether it's uh, IT admins that, um, you know, perhaps or get overly strict and then they're leading uh, into unintentional risk, uh, shadow IT type situations, um, you know, not clearly communicating the why, um, you know, behind this and, and increasing friction uh, with that. Um, and, and certainly, um, you know, having overall ongoing engagement and, and, and feedback. So, so really, really having this balance of security and convenience is uh, is pretty important. All right. So, uh, hopefully, I've picked your interest enough to uh, to get started with this. So, let's let's talk about um, how to get started and and what to uh, what to do next when it comes to risk management. So, first and foremost, uh, similar to 
Uh, defense in depth, um, we have a risk in depth model here. So this talks about uh, using governance. So this is your policies and procedures, uh, different risk exercises. So this would help you identify risks uh, in your organization. So this usually starts and in, in is a bit of a tabletop uh, exercise to determine like uh, what would happen if type scenarios. Uh, perhaps uh, there's some compliance management that you need to take care of and incorporate in your uh, layered risk management or risk in depth approach. Uh, we talked about data and asset classification. Super important to uh, to know what you have so that you can manage it. Uh, providing uh, overall data protection and data loss prevention is is really important. After all, we're talking about uh, not just systems being online, but actual data, especially in the context of data exfiltration and and um, you know insider threats and things of that nature. Having ongoing uh, risk management and ongoing systems monitoring super important. Um, having uh, incident response and forensic services available for uh, the inevitability of that breach, um, performing data and service restoration, and, and last but not least, having cyber insurance. So this this could be uh, you know a bit of a model where you're uh, looking not at uh, defense in depth, where you have like different technology stacks across uh, perhaps the NIST cybersecurity framework core, uh, but you're using um, you know a risk in depth to have a layered approach to your risk management program. Now I want to share a couple tips. Uh, we're in this uh, how to get started and, and what to do phase. So first, uh, first I would say this risk in depth and, and having something uh, in each one of these uh, boxes would uh, would be important. Um, there are six uh, key policies I would say that are also pretty important to have as part of uh, your uh, risk management uh, IT governance program. This this certainly is not exhaustive. I just think that these are the six key ones. So the first one is a a WISP, your written information security plan. The second one is your enterprise change management. So this is uh, when you need to make changes to systems, the process uh, for approvals or or no approvals, perhaps in the case of a, a like a zero day type uh, patch that needs to be applied, uh, having a business continuity plan, right, uh, super critical to ensuring uh, you know testing uh, routine availability and, and and understanding how you would respond uh, in the face of a in the face I'm sorry of a continuity event, uh, an incident response plan. This is huge. Uh, if you truly embrace the breach and you know, like, hey, this is definitely going to happen, uh, you need to have a plan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we we work with you know a bunch of folks providing uh, different levels of incident response services, and um, the organizations that have the most trouble are ones that just ha unfortunately have no plan. There's no there's no kind of like place to start. There's no prescribed anything. And uh, and I would say like of the six key policies you have here, especially in the context of um, cybersecurity risk, have an incident response plan. I, I cannot iterate that enough and review it, tabletop it, test it out, just have an incident response plan. Uh, many organizations, you need to have a privacy policy, especially if you're uh, regulated uh, by GDPR or something along those lines. But um, you see a lot of those uh, you know, annoying cookie uh, pop-ups on websites all over the place now. Uh, all of that has to do with privacy, privacy policy. And last but certainly not least, it's really important to have a vendor or third-party management policy. So how do you evaluate the risk that your vendors uh, provide? Maybe they're um, providing some service to you, um, like the old HVAC people that come in and leave some unsecured equipment on your network, uh, or... Uh, maybe their product is critical to your uh, delivery of services too. Like perhaps maybe you use some online uh, API that, you know, I don't know, does something with your application. And if that's down, uh, your online store is down. And, and perhaps that's just as bad as the database being offline in our previous example, right? Um, so that could be the vendor management part of this. When it comes to uh, having a risk management uh, platform, there's uh, four key tools um, that are available that I, I think are uh, fairly important in in round out um, the various areas to help you like manage this from a tool perspective. So first of all is um, using a GRC tool. So GRC stands for governance, risk, and compliance. Um, this helps you eliminate like double data entry. So if you're working on a couple frameworks, you know, have like a bunch of Excel sheets open and, you know, you answer the same question like 10 different times. Um, these tools really help you automate uh, answering that question one time uh, and applying them either to other areas of the particular framework or let you pivot and, you know, even perform like what if scenarios to another framework. Uh, dark web monitoring. So um, understanding when usernames and passwords are breached is huge. I I'll tell you, like, if you think that MFA is the end all be all to protecting your organization, it's not. Uh, you know, we see a bunch of MFA fatigue uh, out there right now. Um, and username password breach uh, is uh, is still very alive and well. So 
Um, dark web monitoring, not overly interesting on its own, but uh, in the grander scheme of a risk management program, I think it's very important for un- people to understand um, uh, you know, whether their usernames and passwords have been breached. Uh, and certainly if there's been uh, data or somehow you know, data associated with your organization exfiltrated to, uh, to the dark web. Performing, uh, you know, often uh, vulnerability scanning and, and even automated pen testing, which is uh, which is pretty cool now, uh, really helps you understand your internal and external attack surfaces. And this uh, this really supplements your live pen testing with a bunch of automation. In, in that case of pen testing, so um, AI is all the rage, and I have resisted to use the phrase AI up until now. Um, but uh, you know, modern ransomware and modern cyber attackers are using AI to uh, take down your systems faster than ever before. So uh, automated pen testing uh, aims to use, uh, I'll say, AI to fight AIs, right? Um, so why not use that for a good purpose? Um, so enhanced vulnerability scanning on your internal and external networks and, and using automated pen testing is really important in understanding your risks. And last but not least, having secure document storage. So this is uh, secrets management, right? Um, so uh, you may or may not be surprised how many organizations uh, have people that still have, um, you know, note sticky notes with passwords on them or like a word file with like passwords in them. And, you know, perhaps it's not the sysadmins, but maybe it's uh, someone in HR that, uh, you know, has a random password to, you know, the payroll system or something like that. And you haven't given them a tool to securely store and manage their password, right? Um, so that's that's the type of secrets management at scale uh, that that really is important. Uh, having a secure document repository for your policies and procedures. And uh, what's cool is uh, if there's API integration between your secure document storage system and like your GRC system, um, that provides linkage to uh, answer a bunch of the questions um, that are governance related uh, on many of the the NIST and uh, so on and so forth uh, frameworks. So um, anyway, having uh, a separate system to you know securely store things like your incident response uh, procedure and uh, and other you know policies and pre- procedures is uh, is important. And certainly, last but not least, having uh, some notion of your assets, uh, having some tracking and, and overall management of that. And, uh, and, you know, configuration documentation for your environment. So um, I would say like these are the four key tools uh, that really help you uh, along the way. So that's your GRC tool, dark web monitoring, uh, enhanced vulnerability scanning, perhaps with automated pen testing and some sort of uh, secure document storage specifically for, um, you know, IT policies and procedures, your asset tracking, uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, secrets management, like um, your own credentials, your uh, end users credentials and, and things like uh, certificates. Another great place to get started is the uh, NIST uh, risk management framework. So this is just nist.gov slash RMF uh, talks about, uh, you know, using uh, a framework uh, to uh, basically, you know, understand risk and, and using risk for a particular organization. So this is a pretty good, uh, good read. If, uh, if not a little dry, if you're looking to sleep a little bit on the uh, next flight you take, you can download this whole thing and read it. But uh, <laughs> I kid, uh, th- there's, there's a lot of information here, but it is actually a fairly, uh, a fairly good process that talks about risk management. All right. Um, so specifically getting started, right. Um, download that NISC uh, risk management framework. Uh, good to have, good to, good to get to know. Uh, try doing um, try doing a risk calculation. So we did a bunch of risk calculations on that, you know, pizza oven situation and, and pizza dinner. Try that for um, identifying your spend for next year's budget. It's the uh, the end of uh, 2023. Uh, we're looking to head into 2024. So perhaps you could use this as a way to uh, really nail down uh, your your uh, cybersecurity budget based on risk uh, for next year. Um, I'll tell you, when it comes to policies and procedures like sysadmins and IT directors, especially like we're not writers, we don't like writing things, we're not authors. Uh, so I would say lean on, you know, like folks like our pro services are, are really helpful with this uh, chat GPT, believe it or not. Uh, you could use that to start a policy. I, I would not say it's uh, good enough to author a complete policy. And I certainly would not advocate giving it any proprietary information. But if you want like an outline, you know, hey, again, this is only my second time, I guess, highlighting AI, but had to stuff it in somewhere, uh, consider using that um, to, to perhaps help uh, author some of your policies. Um, on the previous slide, uh, we talked about some risk management tools so that was like GRC, uh, dark web monitoring, uh, enhanced vulnerability scanning, and secure document stores. So I would uh, encourage you to explore uh, some of the risk management tools that are out there to make this uh, uh, less painful, right? More, A little more interesting. Um, certainly uh, ongoing monitoring and management services. So we have our own uh, North Star co-manager services, which can help with, um, you know, patching vulnerabilities and, and, you know, keeping systems patched and, and updated. 
Um, and certainly uh, SOC as a service, you know, some sort of, you know, good next gen EDR platform, XDR, MDR, NDR, all the DRs <laughs> um, are, uh, are good, really, really important to have that, uh, especially if you're in the mindset of embracing the breach. Um, have an incident response retainer. I mean, uh, this is this is one area I think that's often overlooked. Like people do a pretty good job um, on kind of like the front end, um, you know, of the NIST or the uh, the left end, if you will, of the NIST framework. But as we look more towards the right end uh, of the cybersecurity core, uh, whether it's like response or recovery, uh, I feel like that as we'll figure it out when it happens. Uh, not 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 a great strategy. So um so make sure you consider your incident response retainer. Um, we we offer a supplemental service called Iris, uh, which uh, supplements your own incident response or um, the incident response of your provider. Um, you know, some examples there, perhaps like your backup uh, is trashed, uh, right? And uh, it's really difficult to recover uh, from that. Most incident response firms don't specialize in uh, infrastructure and in backup and storage and stuff like that. Um, so that's where we come in to kind of be that bridge, if you will, between your uh, IR provider, which could be an internal team and your infrastructure team and helping you like really get that backup system uh, back up and running again. And last but not least, you got to have cyber insurance, right? Um, so make sure you uh, diligently understand the questions that are on that that policy uh, application or renewal, especially the ransomware supplemental uh, stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of questions on there that are directly related to risk management, and, and you're going to want to answer them uh, honestly and correctly. And using a risk-informed approach uh, is a really great way to save a bunch of money on, uh, on cyber insurance or, or make sure that you have uh, eligibility for it. With that, uh, we are basically out of time. So I want to say thank you very much. Uh, I talked a little too much and, and don't have a bunch of time to answer you know, questions, unfortunately, uh, this round. If you have any questions at all, feel free to uh, feel free to send that to the uh, webinars at winslowtg.com and, and we'll get that answered. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to talk with you about uh, risk management, identifying risk, and, uh, and so on and so forth in your environment. I hope this was a valuable use of your time. I just want to say thank you very much. And have a great day.